Hello everyone, before we get started today, we have a very exciting announcement to make. We've made a Patreon! If you'd like to further support our channel, you'll get access to some specialty rewards, including a private Discord. By joining our Patreon, you'll allow us to continue to increase the quality and frequency of our videos. Click the link in the corner of the video or the link in the description to check it out. Now back to our regularly scheduled program. Hello everyone, our topics this week were requested by Sam Reddit Gaming and Harry H. We're going to be going over the Fade, Spirits, Magic, and Mages from the Dragon Age series. So first things first. We're talking about all of these things in one video because they are all heavily interlaced. It's difficult to understand mages and magic if you don't understand spirits, difficult to understand spirits if you don't understand the Fade, and considering that magic has shaped the history and face of Thetis, the world of the Dragon Age games, it's honestly kind of important to understand magic to understand the game's world at large. Let's start with the basics. Magic is derived from one of four sources in the Dragon Age games. The Fade, Lyrium, Living Blood, and The Taint. For more information on The Taint and things relating to it, see our Darkspawn video here. By far the most prevalent source of magic is the Fade, from which we'd say 60% of the magic seen in the game world is pulled, with most of the last 35% coming from Lyrium, and Blood Magic and Taint Magic together making up that last 5% or so. For the record, those numbers aren't official, they're just our experiential guesstimates. So let's begin with the Fade. In the modern day of the Dragon Age games, the Fade is most commonly known as the Realm of Dreams. It is also the source of the vast majority of the world's magic. Lyrium is used to make all known magic items, but unless you're a darkspawn or using blood magic, anytime you see a magical effect take place in the game, the power to create that effect is drawn from the Fade. The Fade itself is a dream reality separated from our world by a mystical construct known as the Veil. The landscape of the Fade is shaped by the impressions and emotions of those who view it. This is why when people dream, the scenery and scenario can be literally anything, and why places and people can seem to shift so suddenly. Powerful minds, generally mages, can enforce a certain degree of solidity to their environment, and particularly powerful spirits have been known to claim regions of the Fade as their own, which tend to have at least a continuing theme if not an outright set layout. But outside of such factors, the only feature within the Fade that never changes is the Black City. From anywhere within the Fade, this mysterious city can be seen, and always seems to remain in the distance. It is supposedly the place from which the Darkspawn taint originated, and it can be inferred that it was at one point an ancient elven city, because it was revealed in the most recent Dragon Age game that the Fade and our world were at one point a singular reality. The mutability of the Fade was joined part and parcel to the immutability of our normal everyday world. Magic flowed through and was a part of everything. Presumably it would have been rarer to be unable to use magic than it would have been to have magical powers. What's more, because of the ambient presence of the Fade's energies, the scale of magic possible in everyday life was orders of magnitude greater than what is considered possible in the game's modern day. For reference, some of the greatest and most powerful magical effects to take place in the game series to date include the manipulation of spirits, the healing of seemingly fatal wounds, the unnatural prolonging of one's life, the forging of sentient golems, and the mystical nuclear bombing of a building. According to Solus, who, spoilers, is an elf that was alive all the way back when the Fade and our world were one, even such effects as the magic nuke are paltry magics compared to the scale of power that could be exercised back during his day. Solus even goes so far as to compare today's people, mages included, to the Tranquil. Quick note, a Tranquil is a mage who has been severed from the Fade and is thus no longer capable of using magic. That is the level of disparity between what is mystically possible today and was possible before. Which makes a certain degree of sense once you understand the basic idea behind how magic works. When a mage casts a spell, what the mage is actually doing is enforcing the mutability of the Fade onto the physical world, basically making the real world as mutable as the dream world, at least for a time or at least in one specific way, creating a moment where it is naturally possible for fire to spring forth from bare stone, or for wounds to heal for seemingly no reason, or for a creature to shift from one form to another. As such, it makes sense that if the Fade's changeable nature was at one point infused into the whole of reality, 
it would be much easier to perform similar feats of power. Kind of like breathing in heavily humid or damp air versus breathing in dry air. You're doing the same thing, you're breathing, but it's much easier to breathe in dry air than it is to breathe in wet, saturated air, so it takes less effort to get the same amount of oxygen. The denizens of the Fade are known collectively as spirits. Spirits are, in simplest terms, literal bits of Fade that have taken life. The more powerful the spirit, the more likely they are to have consciousness and will of their own. Such spirits latch on to the imagery, memories and emotions left behind by the denizens of our world when we interact with the Fade, and take one particular aspect of reality or humanity to become their identity, and then try to exemplify that aspect. These aspects can be anything from justice, wisdom, and compassion, to rage, desire, and pride. Even when spirits possess this sense of self and awareness, however, they are still essentially living fade stuff, meaning they are as mercurial as the dream world around them. In practice, this means two things. Spirits can assume virtually any form they please at a whim, but more importantly, they are shaped by the perceptions of the living mortals who encounter them. Back when the Fade and the rest of the world were one, this was common knowledge. However, in the modern day, that is no longer the case. By the time of the games, it is a commonly held belief that when spirits are involved, bad things tend to happen. Malevolent spirits, such as Pride and Rage, were at some point given the moniker Demon, and tales of demons spread fear amongst the populace. Resultantly, when most people encounter a spirit, they fear that it's some kind of demon, and that fear in turn actually forces the spirit to assume a demonic form. Since spirits almost reflexively mimic whatever thoughts and emotions are thrown its way, Especially powerful spirits are capable of maintaining their sense of self despite such pressures. However, even these creatures can be forcibly changed into different kinds of spirits, or more often demons, through enough magical influence. It's also worth noting that spirits cannot generally pass through the veil, only press up against it and watch. Hence their fascination with dreams. It is said that when spirits do pass through into our world of their own accord, it is possible for them to maintain their sense of self. However, if a spirit is brought across the veil unwillingly or by accident, the shock of our immutable world is so great that they often shift into demons due to their own fear, anger, etc. The last important thing to note about spirits is that, with a handful of exceptions, they can't exist on our side of the veil without some sort of vessel to inhabit an animal, a person, or even a corpse. It's for this reason, and the aforementioned widespread belief that all spirits are demons, that it's a common practice across Thetis to burn the dead so that no free vessel is left for spirits that may wander our world. The next most common source of magic in the Dragon Age games is Lyrium. Unlike the Fade, no known creatures naturally tap into the power of Lyrium. Instead, Lyrium is a physical object that must generally be processed and refined before use. Lyrium, in its natural form, is pure, raw magic in crystallized form that grows like ore veins deep in the earth. Once again, in the most recent game, it was revealed that all Lyrium is actually the lifeblood of the Titans, gigantic behemoths of stone that live and slumber deep, deep beneath the earth. So we suppose that technically one creature does utilize the power of Lyrium in its natural state, the raw, concentrated power of Lyrium is so great that most races of Thetis can be driven mad and are even physically harmed by direct contact with the stuff. Dwarves, who do not dream and thus have no connection to the Fade, making them highly resistant to all forms of magic, Lyrium included, control the Lyrium trade. But even they can suffer adverse effects from continued unsafe exposure to raw Lyrium. In contrast, mages are said to risk death just by approaching the unrefined stuff. All of this is, of course, before it's been refined into a usable state. While still dangerous, refined lyrium is generally considered safe so long as baseline precautions are taken, much like a modern-day live electrical wire or something similar. Dangerous if you're stupid or careless, but generally safe so long as you follow safety regulations. To the best of our knowledge, any magical item encountered in the games has been somehow treated with lyrium. Pre-fade separation ancient elven structures and artifacts that still exist and function may be an exception to this rule, considering the nature of magic at the time, but this is unclear. Lyrium is imprinted into objects as runes, woven as strands into cloth or other soft materials, or even reduced to a powder and added to liquid for consumption as lyrium potions. Worked into objects, Lyrium forms the magical framework necessary for every flashy magic sword and seemingly physics-defying magical construct in the game world. 
Lyrium potions, meanwhile, enhance the natural magical abilities of the imbiber, granting mages greater wells of strength to draw from, and even helping those without a natural magical spark, such as Templars, to harness magical power. It should be noted that small-scale normal magical items, such as weapons and armor, have no known negative side effects from continued use or exposure. Theoretically, larger magical apparatus could cause some of the aforementioned lyrium-based dangers if it were damaged or the lyrium was somehow exposed. Lyrium potions, however, should be considered dangerous. Overuse can lead to a damping of magical power, and the potions are also addictive. The last two forms of magic are Taint Magic, which is covered in slightly more detail in our Darkspawn video, but for all intents and purposes seems to function identically to Fade-based magic, possibly additionally granting Darkspawn an extra reservoir of power to draw from, much like someone who has imbibed a Lyrium Potion, though it could be argued that some Darkspawn-specific abilities could be labeled as Taint-specific magic. And then there's Blood Magic. Primarily, blood magic serves a similar purpose to lyrium potions, granting the user more power than they would normally possess. And yes, lyrium usage and blood magic can theoretically stack together for double effectiveness. Much like all spirits have been stigmatized as only being dangerous demons in common culture, blood magic has been stigmatized as an evil, horrendous practice across most of Thetis, and is almost universally condemned across countries and cultures. The practice of blood magic involves drawing the blood from either the caster's own body or the bodies of others, willing or not. Which is where a good portion of the blood magic's negative reputation comes from. After all, magic empowered by murdering people and then using their life essence for incredible power must be evil, right? To be fair, if you're actually using that way, yeah, you, you, you're probably evil. The other major stigma point concerning blood magic, however, comes from blood magic's seemingly unique ability to manipulate the minds of others. So it's a form of magic that takes literal lifeblood from people and then can be used to control people. Much like any real-world weapon, there is little indication that blood magic is itself inherently any more evil or otherwise harmful than normal magic, but its potential for abuse is much more readily noticeable. Additionally, it has been noted that blood magic weakens a mage's connection to the Fade, Presumably because blood is very much a part of the immutable earthly realm we call home. Which makes it likely that the practice of blood magic was less common before the Fade was locked away, since it would almost be more of a handicap than a power boost. Finally, we look at mages. Mages are simply mortal men and women of every race known to Thetis, except for dwarves, again, no dreams, no Fade, no magic, that possess a strong connection to the Fade, and can thus use it to manipulate the fabric of our world's reality. The only real point of note that needs to be made about mages individually are their relationships with spirits. Like all other living things, mages can be possessed by spirits. However, when this happens unwillingly or when the spirit is a demon, the result of possessing a mage is unique. The mage becomes what is known as an abomination, a dangerous, violent creature with greater power than either the spirit or the mage would have had individually. This risk of turning into abominations has shaped the perception of mages throughout Thetis. For purposes of the mage discussion, the world can be broken down into four categories. The nation of Tevinter, the nation of the Kunari, the Dalish people, and everywhere else. The Dragon Age games take place across vast stretches of Thetis, and almost all regions that players have been able to experience fall into this everywhere else category. In regions like Ferelden, the Free Marches, and Orlais, mage life is dominated by a religious order called the Chantry, which cloisters mages into groups called circles. Mage circles are gathering places, towers, citadels, compounds, islands, etc., for mages. When a person is identified as having magical power, be they old or young, they are shipped off to the circles to be trained in the ways of magic. In the circles, a mage learns to control their power and protect themselves from demons, though by demons they mean all spirits. Because mages, as beings capable of crossing into the Fade to varying degrees, more readily attract the attention of spirits, and thus, on top of being more dangerous when possessed, are at a greater risk of possession in the first place. And, of course, since they are taught this way, spirits are even more likely to take the form of demons when encountered because that is what the mage expects. A circle mage's entire training during early life revolves around ensuring that they are strong enough of mind and body to resist demonic possession, culminating in a ritual forcing a mage to confront a demon within the Fade and thus face becoming an abomination head-on. These practices have all led to mages being feared or even hated in general culture, often being, at best, considered incredibly dangerous ticking time bombs ready to be possessed at any moment, hence the reason mages are clustered together and guarded, as much for their protection as for everyone else's. 
The Dalish elves take a less ostracized approach to training their mages, but consider magic only moderately less dangerous than the majority of Thetis. Each Dalish clan is led by a keeper. A keeper is always a mage of incredible wisdom and generally incredible power. This keeper will train up to two other mages in the clan at any given time. However, keeping more than about three, on rare occasions four, mages together in one clan is considered dangerous, as it may attract unwanted spirits. Thus, when clans reach this number of mages, one of the four is sent away from the clan. Preferably, this is accomplished by sending an extra mage to another Dalish clan who is lacking in mages. But exact practices vary by clan and can even be so extreme as to leave newly discovered mage children to fend for themselves after being abandoned by the clan. The two most extreme cultures in terms of handling mages, however, are the Kunari and Tevinter. The Kunari have the least tolerance for magic in all of Thetis. While they bear no ill will to mages on a personal level, mages are considered to be the single most dangerous creatures in all of creation. An opinion likely shaped by the general consensus across cultures, the Kunari mages are, in general, more powerful than the mages of other races, and are thus kept under strict lock and key. The Kunari culture is a culture of the whole over the one. Every Kunari is taught from birth to serve the greater good of their people over their personal interests. As such, self-sacrifice is considered one of the most laudable traits a person can have in Kunari culture. Because of this, despite the fact that Kunari mages are literally magically chained up and watched at all times, the general cultural opinion of Kunari mages is that they are to be praised for their self-sacrifice, as they are presumed to be constantly struggling within themselves to avoid becoming abominations. Despite this, the Kunari take no chances with their mages. They will use their mages in battle and such when available or necessary. However, if a mage is ever separated from their guardian, it is to be assumed that they have been possessed whilst alone, and the mages are to be slain on sight, along with any and all who may have been in contact with the mages while their guardian was not present. Such is the cultural conditioning of the Kunari that many of the mages themselves follow these beliefs and will either kill themselves when separated from their guardians or return to their guardians and submit to execution for the good of their people, afraid that they themselves have been corrupted without someone to watch them. Which leaves us with Tevinter. Tevinter's handling of magic is on the polar opposite end of the spectrum from the Kunari. The nation of Tevinter is actually ruled by mages, and probably serves as the source of half of the world's examples why mages are too dangerous to be left to their own devices. As historically speaking, the unique freedom had by Tevinter's mages has led to horrible events in the past that would never have occurred anywhere else. On the flip side, however, it is often assumed that Tevinter's mages in general also have a much greater grasp of magic's capabilities and limitations, since there are significantly fewer restrictions on the practice of magic there than anywhere else in the world. In simplest terms, the more magical talent and skill a mage possesses, the higher it is possible to rise in society. Conversely, there is a glass ceiling for non-mages that they and their families can only hope to break by siring a mage child to pull them up from the dust. Blood magic is especially common in Tevinter. In ages past, blood magic was practiced openly. In today's Tevinter, however, blood magic is officially frowned upon. Technically, it's illegal or the next best thing to illegal. However, it is common knowledge that past a certain rank in society, everyone practices blood magic. It's sort of comparable to the idea from real life of everyone knowing who the mob boss was, but never having any proof survived the light of day, so legally the mob boss was clean and totally not a mob boss. Similarly, everyone knows the upper echelon of Tevinter mages practice blood magic, but unless someone is caught, there's no proof and no punishment. Even if they are tearing apart their rivals behind closed doors and drowning in the blood of their butchered slaves to stay in power. And that's basically the overall story of magic in the world of the Dragon Age games. From the Fade to the mages tapping into it and everything in between. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave us a like. If you have ideas for videos you'd like to see us do in the future, do like Sam Reddit Gaming and Harry H and let us know in the comments down below. If you'd like to see more videos from us in the future, be they lore or let's play, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. In the meantime, this has been True, True Masters, Masters and, and Morons, Morons signing, signing off. off. Thanks for watching this video. If you want to see more like it, hit this subscribe orb. To see our last Let's Play, click or tap the link on the right. For our last lore video, go to the link on the left. And for a video chosen by the gods of YouTube from our channel, hit that link on top. Thanks, Thanks for, for watching, watching, and we'll, we'll see, see you next time. time.